Good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody. It is a Tuesday morning, 10.02 on your clock. And we're just going to wait an extra few minutes before we get going so more people can join in like I always do. I started up the Instagram live feed just to try to collect people as their notifications should go off that we've gone live to remind them to head over to the Zoom and to the chat and to, of course, the Google Classroom. Our main source of information is here at this Google Classroom. So please tell your friends, tell your friends about the Google Classroom. Very, very important that everyone checks in to the Google Classroom every single day, if not multiple times a day, to see if there's any major updates and grades that were sent back and things like that. So um, throwing it out there that Google Classroom is probably the most important thing and We'll do a quick review of what's going on this week. And uh, of course, we'll do our live lesson in just a minute or two. Um, so hopefully people start coming into the live chat uh, and Instagram and reminding them that now they need to head over to the Zoom classroom today. Um, a couple things really fast. I've been grading things off and on for the last few days as things are um starting to be handed in or have been handed in i've been going through them piece by piece and grading them so all the classwork that has been handed in for something like an 8b um, has been graded and given back there are still again 15 people that are in the classroom that have not done it that's concerning um 11 of you finished project 8c 13 of you still haven't done that concerning indeed i'm a little bit concernicus and uh, yeah, there's still three of Project D's that I haven't graded, but six came back and there's still, again, 15 of you that haven't done it. And then we have another project coming up on this Friday, this Friday. Um, so this was that live masterclass you guys are doing each and every day. Hopefully you watched your first 15 minutes yesterday. Um, and then you, of course, recorded uh, the information on the top sheet. You can type into it if you'd like or you can print it and handwrite it, doesn't matter to me. Um, and again, the biggest part of this to me and for the class, what the most you're gonna get out of it um, is of course, the, um, the questions that you're gonna pose, of course, the questions that you guys are going to come up with. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. Make sure you're doing that each and every day. 24 people total in the classroom, which still doesn't account for every single student in our program. We're still mix, missing close to I don't know, 10 or so, or maybe a little more than 10 students in our classroom. But thank you for the people that are tuning in every day. Um, the average of 10 to 12 people every single day in the Zoom classroom. It's really important, uh, not only for you guys to get the information, but also then to do well on the test. Now, speaking of the test, I released some of the grades back to you uh, from the test. Uh, for those of you who went back and did what I had asked, and that is to resubmit, and there's Mike's little thing there, but I asked you to resubmit your test, uh, but this time with your email address. Like I said to you, I only had generic um, names on each test, so I had no way of matching your test to your name. Uh, so I made some changes in the Google Classroom settings for our quiz. So when you go into the quiz, as you can see, now you have to type in your email address. Again, the email address you're using for this Google Classroom, all right? If you haven't done that yet, make sure you do that today. I do have it in the system as it being due today. It says right here, due today. It also comes up in the stream, due today. So please make sure that you go back into the quiz, type in your email address, and if the questions weren't already answered, just make sure you go back and answer them. And then a grade will be generated and I will send it back to you. Uh, one of the cool things about the Google Classroom is also, oh uh, no, that's not what I want to say, uh, lead page, um, is the responses, which I found really, really cool, some statistics about how you guys were answering questions. Um, and I mentioned this yesterday, um, so, you know, basically it shows me who got what and who got what scores. It gives me a, a, an average, a median, a range, 
Um, I can also break it down by each question. And of course, individual people here, Kim, um, shows me what she got right and what she got wrong. And you will be able to see that once you've resubmitted your test back to me. So please make sure you do that. Um, very, very important in order to get that test grade. And we will be doing another test on Friday on the MIDI stuff that we're going to do throughout the week. Um, anybody have any questions about any of the work that's on Google Classroom as of right now? Any questions about the Google Class? Any questions? Questions, questions, questions. All right, so you all know what's necessary. You all know what is expected of you. As we continue now to go even further into the month of April with doing this distance learning, um, one of the things that uh, I did find out, uh, even though we have a scheduled quote unquote spring break in the month of April, um, virtual classes will not stop. No one's going anywhere. So we're going to lose our quote unquote spring break. Um, and we will continue doing this every weekday throughout the entire month of April. And then the hope is, as we get closer to the finish line on this, um, we'll be back in school hopefully sometime uh, early to mid-May, as long as we see results and they have a strategy or a plan to start integrating people back into the world together. All right. So every day, Google Classroom, every day, project every week, quiz every Friday, going back to our standard routine now that we're up and fully functional. All right, um, so let's do some logic work if no one has any other questions. And we are going to open the old test project. Right? And uh, the hope here is that we learn a little bit more. I'm gonna just push down my, um, let's see, push down my participants here so I can see more of my screen, there we go. All right, um, so yeah, yesterday we, basically started off by creating some virtual software instrument tracks. Um, we then programmed in, uh, in MIDI notes, notes into each track. We kind of went over how to quantize that information here, down here in the piano roll. Um, and we also then looped out MIDI sections. So once we created our four bar loop, we were able to drag it out. We then took those loops and created individual clips using control L. And then I showed you how you can um, change then individual loops. So it's not this redundant four bar loop over and over and over again. Nobody wants to hear the same thing for three and a half minutes. So you want some sort of variation in a lot of your project, right? Even if it's subtle, very small things. You also want to have things build up in and out and then I guess as the piece goes along or the composition travels along the timeline, you want it to feel just a little different throughout. Even though it's the same four chords from start to finish here, um, what we did was we kind of progressed that from start to finish. So we started off with our uh, drum kit and basic piano notes. We generated that using my little mini keyboard, but I also showed you a little bit of how you can take that and quantize it and edit it. Um, and then of course, once we looped everything out, we kind of removed some pieces. We also in this third section of the piano um, added a little lead. And then when we brought the violins back in, it then came to this precipice, this uh, full sound again. So let's just review of what we did, um, just to kind of give you an idea of um, you know, what you're hearing. And then you can see a little bit more so you're familiar with the project of what we're gonna do down here in the piano roll today. So here is the song again. So that was our 16 bar loop. Like I said, it, it 
felt like it built to a certain point, started off with the basic elements, dropped one element out, dropped another element out, but this time added in a new element into the piano. And at the very end, we added in crash cymbals on the drums. We kept the lead from the piano, and then we added in our violin here uh, at the very end. And again, that helped us build like this intro to first verse kind of concept. And then we can move on from there. I mean, we're not gonna create much more to this. We're just gonna use this as a way and a guide to do stuff in Logic. So uh, like I said yesterday, we kind of went through this piano roll and the parts of the piano roll. Again, some menu items, uh, the ability to kind of condense and only see the notes that were used. That's what this key was. Um, we can look at some of the controller information like note velocity or anything else that was added in as a data point. For instance, on my chord keyboard that I have, I do have a sustain pedal. So if I hold down the sustain, that means I'm holding down the length of the note and how long it takes to decay out. So without it, it just sounds like that. But with it on, it holds it out for a while. Now that information is stored within the performance. And to look at that information, obviously you'd have to go to sustain pedal. So these are just some of the things that are available to you. I guess it all depends on the complexity of the keyboard or the MIDI controller that you're using to get this information in there. Obviously, I don't have any foot uh, control or, or breath. Um, there's a little bit of modulation in this. So you can hear it wave a little bit. Um, but for the most part, there's not much of that mod uh, sound here now. Um, but you know we have the ability to kind of pitch things up and down and mess around with some of the data that gets recorded in here during your live performance. And that was kind of what we looked at and reviewed yesterday. Uh, today, what I wanna do is show you how you don't have to necessarily have a per se MIDI controller. Um, one of the things that we can take advantage of is the keyboard option and that is Command K. Command K actually brings up a virtual keyboard that now turns the keys on your regular keyboard into notes. So if I hit the A, it's a note. If I hit the uh, S and the W and the D, uh, F, G. So technically speaking, I don't need a MIDI controller for this particular software. And it was the same lead that we did before. So Command K kind of hides and reveals that uh, controller data um, that we can type in here in a live situation. So um, again, if I just uh, highlight a four bar section, let's say I want to loop this out just to have a basic drum beat, Control L to make it its own loop. Um, so now in this loop, right, I can now, if I wanted to add in a brand new set of notes, so if I wanted to record something here, and there it is. So I can just use this floating keyboard and my regular computer keyboard to type in notes. And you can see um, that the data was here. And it doesn't really take in too much of the velocity information like a normal keyboard would. You can see it's pretty much all consistent at a very specific uh, velocity here. Move this up a little bit. Um, so we can go in and edit it afterwards. Let's see how this sounds. So uh, let's get into some editing here in the piano roll, all right? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in, I'm just gonna quantize this information. I'm gonna give it a good quantize um, to the 1 16th note. We'll see if it snaps correctly. And it's a little off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna pull some of this guy and this guy jump forward. So I'm just gonna pull them back where they should be. 
The rest of these notes look pretty good. Let's see how it sounds. That one's a little ahead, so I'm gonna take my pointer tool, grab the note and pull it back. I find that this note probably should have been um, a chord. So there's a couple of things I can do here to change this note and make it into two notes. So it would then push again here. So um, one of the things I could do very easily is just take my tool, it turns into a trim tool and drag that back. All right, opening up a space for the next note to be played. So now I need a note here. All right, if I hold down option, I click on the note, it actually will store the pitch and the velocity and the length of that note. So when I add a brand new note, it's the exact same note. Um, that is a very useful tool. I do that quite a lot. Um, I'll show you that again. So let me back up out of this here. So there's a note here we want to make two notes out of. I'm going to drag this one back. All right, just pull it back a little bit. I'm going to hold down option and click on the note to copy its information. Then I let go of option and I just click into here with my uh, draw tool. And there goes the note. Another way you could do it is literally just hold down option and make a copy. As you can see, it does make a copy. I'm going to show you another way you could do it. Um, there is a tool that actually cuts the note in half. So if we cut it right here at that line, you can see it cuts it right at the 20 bar mark. Either way, any of those three ways works. Um, and here's the result of that. That's exactly what we were looking for, right? We wanted a, a fourth chord with these three notes here in that last bar. So that's what we were looking to do. And we accomplished that by using some basic edit tools or some modifiers that we're already very familiar with, um, you know, going in into a project and cutting and copying and that kind of stuff. All right. um, so yeah, I mean, this, this little area down here, can allow me a lot of different flexibility and options. You can see that the velocity on all these notes is exactly the same. Well, we know a real piano player isn't necessarily gonna play the notes the exact same way with all of his fingers every single time. Uh, case in point, let's look at this one. This was me playing on the keyboard and you can see the colors are all different that represents the colors are being represented by the velocity or the velocity is being represented by the colors. So in this one, they're all the same color and that's because we use the floating keyboard. Um, that is one of the things that it does. It actually um, unifies all velocities. So I want to break it out of that. I don't want it to be consistent velocities. Right? I want it to be a little more humanistic, not, um, you know, extremely robotic or electric. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use one of our menu options to create variations in um, velocities. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and highlight my notes. All right, I'm going to go into functions and I'm going to go into this little thing called MIDI transform. So this is a way that we can take blocks and big things of MIDI notes and change them. And there's a whole bunch of different things here that are really very cool. So let's go into uh, random velocity because that's the result that I'm looking for here, random velocity. So here is our MIDI transform window. All right, and this is, I, I do use this a lot. There's a lot of cool ways that you can program MIDI notes um, without having to perform it every single time. Uh, so random velocity is very interesting. Uh, of course, we're gonna randomize it. Here's our settings. And this is the range in which the velocities will be 127 to 40. Now that's the entire range, 40 being the softest, 127 being the loudest. Now, if you recall yesterday, I was dropping things down to about 105. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that to 105, maybe 109, okay? Then the lowest or softest played note, I'm gonna raise that up because 40 is just way too low. I'm gonna make it like 90, 
All right, 90 is a pretty good spot. All right, and then I'm going to click in select and operate. 16 events found, and let's take a look at what happened. So you can see now that the notes have changed their color. Their velocities have changed. It is randomly picked which notes to push up, which notes to push down. Let's take a look at what the velocities are. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So I'm gonna pull this back up here so you guys can see the velocity. So this note is at 106, whereas this note is at 94. Very interesting. And this note is at 93, and then this one's at 107. So it is absolutely varied um, you know, in here. So let's hear how that changes the performance, if at all. Now, here's where I saw the biggest differences. These accented, higher velocity notes. I can hear them pop through the mix just a little more than the other ones. So it definitely gave me a change in the performance, and it gave me this almost more humanistic-based uh, result. And that's what I was looking for. That's exactly what I wanted to do. And if I wanted to even make it more um, obvious, I'd probably change the range. I changed the range to something much larger. So let's try that for a second. We'll go into functions and MIDI transform, and we'll go to random velocity. It's already stored in there from what we had. So I'm gonna increase that up a little more. Maybe go to, um, I don't know, let's go up to uh, 120. And we'll keep this at 90, all right? And so we'll do a click on select and operate. And so now I come in here and I'm gonna take a look at my notes and look at that now. Our notes here are much more uh, randomized. Again, this one is at 104, but this one's at 117. Here's 119, here's 120. That's not how I played it. I played it straight at a certain velocity. Now we've kind of changed that. Let's hear how this result gives us a different performance. And again, the subtleties of those higher velocity notes change the performance in one way or another. It took me from a extremely, um, you know, robotic, um, I don't know, uh, you know, electronic, almost sequencer-esque type of performance now to a more humanistic performance where it was like I actually played the notes with my keyboard. And to be honest, again, I didn't play the notes with my keyboard. I played the notes with my floating keyboard. Command K uh, allowed me to, allow me to play it. Um, so different ways of approaching that. Let's see what else is available to us in the MIDI transform window, because there's a lot of other things that we can do. Uh, we'll go back to random velocity, and this time we'll go up to the top where the presets are, and here's all the things that we can do. Okay, fixed velocity obviously means all the notes are gonna be the exact same velocity. I tried to get away from that and make it randomized velocity to give it a little more um, you know, humanistic approach. We can actually randomize the pitch, um, so if I go in here and I just choose that, take a look at what that does. All of a sudden, the notes go all over the place. What does that sound like? Um, I think we can all agree that's pretty awful. <laughs> but you could technically use that at times between a certain key range in order to get like this really cool performance. Maybe you want something very experimental or something very spacey. Um, doing this with a synthesizer sometimes sounds really cool, but it's in there and it's one of the options you have to choose from in this um, MIDI events window. Uh, we use velocity. You can actually do all three and that is pitch, velocity, and length. So that's pretty cool as well. Let's see what this does. So now obviously it changes a whole lot of what's going on in here. Um, took away a lot of the data it scattered the notes kept them at the same time in the timeline so it was still every bar and every beat um randomized obviously the uh velocities and uh let's hear what that did and again not something 
obviously way far away from what originally I did, but yet something that could be used to kind of generate something new, something that you didn't perform or you didn't think of was possible. So again, this is just showing you this is all uh, a, a very cool way of, of working with uh, MIDI. Uh, crescendo. If you don't know what a crescendo is, that means um, it will basically build up and get louder or get softer. Um, so I want to show you down here in this little chart what is possible. And I can actually use the map, and there it is, to kind of create some sort of increase in velocity for this way. Instead of using just numbers like 40 to 127, I actually have a map here. And so this map's showing me a steady increase in velocity as it gets louder. Now I can actually make it you know, a little different by taking my mouse and drawing in information. I'm just clicking, holding, and dragging. Clicking, holding, and dragging. So we can do it that way. So let's see what happens when I use this function. And I'm gonna hit select and operate. You can see that it tends to get louder and louder as it goes along. Um, I'll do that for a minute. And there is a very easy way of changing that. Uh, let's go into uh, scale 14-bit pitch bend. Lily. Um, this obviously is using the controller data of the pitch bend, of which um, right now I don't have any information in. So you can see nothing really happens to the notes themselves. But obviously if I had uh, MIDI information, from the pitch bend controller, I would be able to hear changes in the pitch bend information. Uh, we can actually speed up and slow down. So double speed would mean that I would get a faster performance. So if I select and operate this, you can see everything shrunk down. Cuts it down from four bars to two bars. So here it is. That's pretty cool if you don't know how to speed up your performance, that is one way to do it. Or you can even slow it down by going to half speed. And we'll select and operate. And there it goes. So here's a different performance. Very cool. Uh, we'll undo that. Go back to these notes. So easy way of doing that is right through this. Uh, humanize. So this is kind of what I was talking about here in regards to your ability to take something that is very digital, um, very stagnant really, or electronic or sequencer-esque um, for a piano performance, of course, not from maybe for drums, but for a piano performance, um, and change it. Uh, the humanize feature uses uh, random changes in uh, the pitch, velocity, and of course, the channel. So here, take a look at what happens to our MIDI notes when we humanize them. And then that was it. I mean, there wasn't much change there, but you could see, again, the notes are all randomized. They're not standard notes or note values. Here it was before, here it was after. So you can see these two notes, of course, change tremendously. Um, and it gives you, a, a, again, a same concept of doing a random velocity. This is more like how a human would interpret a change over time in a performance. Uh, what else we have here? Uh, reverse position, that's very interesting. So let's do that and see what happens. Okay, not much. So in this case, um, the reverse, let me go back in here, really didn't swap anything out. It kind of kept things in place, but if in fact I had an opposite performance, uh, and I wanted to kind of switch it up. That absolutely is something you can do using the MIDI transform window. Uh, reverse pitch. We don't have any pitch data in there. So again, you're not going to hear much of a change. But if we did, we could reverse the pitches of the notes as they travel along. Uh, transposing. And then now we get into like these areas that are really very, very specific. Uh, velocity limiter, which sets a cap and the um, the velocity number. So if you want to cap it at 120, so you didn't go all the way up to 127, you can do that. Uh, exponential velocity, uh, fixed note length. That's interesting. I've used that before. Um, our fixed note length, 
And this is what happens. As you can see, every note conforms to an exact note length. I've used that before. That one's relatively useful while creating MIDI notes or while editing a performance. Uh, minima, uh, maximum minimum note length, quantize note length. Um, so basically same concept, we're uh, basically quantizing both the in and the out of every note. And then actually you can build up your own transform set. So that allows you, but make sure you understand this, in the MIDI transform, just like in an EQ, there are presets. So these are ones that were built for us already. We can build our own, which means you can do any condition that's located up here. Positioning, status, channel, pitching, velocity, lengths, all of this customized to your performance in this particular MIDI window. Um, very, very cool. I use it a lot. I use the MIDI transform a lot, especially to kind of like change up and really rotate my performances. Um, let's go in and, and create some MIDI notes here now by hand. And that's really where I wanted to go today before I got on the uh, MIDI transform bus. So here's how it works, all right? Um, sorry, I'm gonna get myself over here. So right now I selected the Violins 2, the Violins 2 track. And now I'm going to actually, instead of play, instead of playing on my keyboard, I'm going to actually draw. I'm going to create with my pencil tool. So first thing I'm gonna do in this window is I'm gonna set my pencil tool as my main tool. That's this guy right here, the pencil tool. And I'm gonna set my secondary tool to my pointer tool. And I just did that by clicking on T, holding down Command and selecting T again. All right, so that becomes my pointer tool. Whoops, no, T and P is my primary tool. So when I'm in here, I wanna be able to draw a note just like that. All right, so uh, let's first find out um, the key of this, right? So I did. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually octave down a little bit. And really let the violins become the low end of this performance. I wanna see, and you can see when I hit it on my keyboard, I can tell which one it is. So I'm gonna draw a C here, and there's one. Good. Then my E, so I'm gonna draw that one in. I'm just clicking on the line. And a G, right? So we'll just click them in, okay? So those three notes now should support the low end. Let's hear how it sounds right now. It's actually pretty awful. So let's move them up to a different range. TT brings me there. And now let's move them. Let's move them up a full octave. So let's hear how it sounds now. Nope. I'm gonna end this up here. What am I gonna do? Oh, I see what I did. I did mess up. Let me move this back up to where it's supposed to be. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna want these two notes to go from start to finish in the entire four bar loop. So I'm gonna quickly, quickly select them and then I'm gonna drag them out until bar 21 starts, right there. All right. So um, with that said, I'm going to want to now uh, have these notes. So I'm pretty sure that's how it goes, right? So those three are gonna be my main changes. So we'll do that one, two. So let's draw in another note, uh, which is the next one here. Um, we'll go ahead and just pencil tool it in. So T, pencil tool, and we'll draw the next one. And then we'll draw the next one. And we'll draw the next one at the next one. And you can see how that's gonna work. So now let's see how that performance is. I'm simply just using my tools to draw in MIDI notes. Here we go.
And now at this point, I can pretty much tell that these notes are really loud. They're overtaking the mix. So in this part, I'm gonna to wanna to drop the velocities down just so I hear a little less of them in the mix. So let's see how that works. Right, and we can actually drop them down even more so. Just, we want them back there just subtly so it kind of supports that low end. There it is. And so what I'm doing is I'm just creating variation, adding bit by bit, piece by piece. In the case of the piano, I played it using Command K, um, using the keyboard for that. In the case of the violins, this time I actually used basic mouse and keyboard tools found right here, T, P as a pencil tool in order to draw in a new note. Now here's what we're also gonna do, so check this out. Um, we're going to take these notes. We're actually going to make a copy of them at the next octave. So I'm going to hold down option as I click on the bottom note. And I'm going to make another copy. Let's see how this supports each other. And because they're all in the same key, using all the same chords, they all kind of sing and play in harmony with each other. I think this particular set of notes that I just copied now kind of stands out in the mix. So for these, I'm gonna drop them down even further in the velocity, just so they're a little less prominent in the mix. Let's hear how that sounds. Right, so now we're starting to do even uh, mixing while doing MIDI creation, kind of thinking ahead to how I want things to play together within the mix. So those are the two major ways that you can basically create MIDI notes in this software without actually having to perform it or having a MIDI keyboard. Um, similarly, you can do this in Pro Tools, so it's not any different in there than it is in here. It just, this is probably more, um, dynamic and uh, well let's just be honest it's a lot more easy to create notes in this piano roll area. For those of you who are really interested in beyond this um, there is a score editor where if you're very familiar with how to create um, you know sheet music uh, you can do that right here and you can see my performance of these violins is available to you here with your left hand and your right hand or well, right hand and left hand and it gives you your 4-4 it tells you where these notes are gonna lie, tells you how long to hold these notes, they're all being held for a whole beat. And for those of you who read sheet music, you can start seeing the connection between MIDI notes and a score or and a performance that you would play with a real instrument. Another part of this editor down here that I wanna talk about today is the step editor. So this is very interesting, all right? This is a note by note um, reference to MIDI controller data. Let me show you something even more crazy. I'm gonna select all of these tracks up here, the Sunset Kit, the Steinway Grand, and the violins. And in the step editor, it populates this entire window with all the notes in those keys. And so what I can do in here very easily is find a note by simply clicking on it, and I can actually change its velocity here. I didn't want these crashes to be so loud. Instead of maybe going into the sunset kit loop here and turning it down, I could actually do it right from the step editor, very easily find that note and change things. So this is my hi-hats, this is my snare, this is my kick. All right, going into the piano, here are all my notes. All right, those are all my Cs. Now uh, at bar 19, here's all the notes that were played. So this one, this one, and this one. So you get to see how they uh, have interacted. And you can see as we turn down the velocities in some of these notes of the violins too, you can see that their stalks, like we saw in Pro Tools, aren't as tall as the other ones are in the Grand Piano or in the Sunset Kit. These have very loud velocities whereas the violins have very short or small or soft velocities.
And you can hear the change in how the instrument reacts when you change the velocity. When it's low, it just kind of sits there. When you get up high, it really starts acting up a little bit. So in that case, I'm gonna bring this back down to, I think, what was this at? This was at 54. So we'll put it right around there. Now let me show, show you something kind of cool um, that I've used before. And uh, we're gonna do just a quick drum roll, all right? Um, and here's how we're gonna do that. Let's, uh, let's create some MIDI notes. Uh, we'll make a, another uh, clip here. And I got an octave down. So we'll do something like that here in the back end. What I'll do is I'll also loop out uh, violins so I have something to work with as I do my uh, recording loop here. Um, so I'm going to show you how that crescendo thing we talked about in MIDI transform and how this step editor can help us do drum rolls. So let's do it here. I'm not the best performance, but we can go in and always change that. Obviously in our piano roll, you can see what I did in my pattern. You can highlight these really quick and again, quantize them. Let's take a listen to that really fast. Not bad, see, quantizing actually does help. Now you can see there's some accented ones. Obviously uh, I played some keys or ones louder than others. While we have a change here, we probably should make. Let's take a look at how we can edit this better and take a look at the pattern that I used. Okay, so we missed something there on this one. Um, so the pattern was, um, all right, we're gonna use this one. So it starts off every bar with one, two, one, two, two, and then a third here. So option click on a note, and then I can draw in one right here using my pencil tool. So T, my pencil tool, draw one right there. And then right after that fourth note, there's a little bit of a space and a boom, boom. So let's see if that. So yeah, we're gonna have to move these guys around a little bit. They're a little too close to that one. Skip them over on a bar. Right. Oh, come on. Let's go. Move over. There we go. Let's see how that sounds. Okay, not bad. A um, couple things I probably could do is just eliminate that, and then it's a steady note hit down here. I'll zoom in a little further so I can see it easier. Bring these guys down to this. Let's see how that turns out. Right? Um, so, um, probably missing a few notes here on the back end. Let's see what we got. Uh, let's make a copy of this. Let's see how this works here. So, I'm gonna go over and take off my loop for a second so I can really concentrate on this back edge. Um, of these two, this one bar, really, it's all it is. I think we're missing one note back here that I'm gonna wanna add. So again, T and P, I hold down Option and copy this note and then really draw that note there as our final one. And in this one, I kinda want it to be like this really loud, hard accented one. So I'm gonna take the velocity of that one and. You know, li literally let it really ring out. So let's see how that finally turned out now that we made our little edits. Perfect. Exactly what I was looking for. So now we can concentrate on velocities and changing the performance. Let's 
highlight them all. And let's go into our MIDI transform as we did before. And let's make a um, random velocity range. Again, I'm going to probably go from around 100 at the low end and about 115 to the high end. And we're going to select an operate. And that kind of, again, evens out all of our note pitches. And I'm sorry, all our note velocities. Okay, so that works for me. Um, and now I want to show you what I was going to talk to you about before, and that is let's go into the step editor and let's see if we can make um, some sort of change in velocity that will allow us to kind of create a crescendo. Now watch how this works. Let's look at our tools here. We do have a line tool in this window, and that line tool allows me to kind of click here and draw a line to that. So you can see. I made a very uh, defining upwards trend in velocity. And I'll do a similar one on this one to kind of match. So let's hear how that sounds, but also look at the piano roll and see how the note values all now have changed their color. So it's gonna start from a very low drum roll to something very loud at the end. Let's take a listen. <laughs> So right, it, it creates that buildup of snare, but let's say you didn't want it like that. Let's say you want just that buildup to be these last few notes. Highlight those last few notes, go into the step editor. Here are those notes, I'm pretty sure. Step editor, yep, that's what it looks. Well, no, it does look like it's just these guys back here, right? Right, so these notes here are the ones I really want to create that crescendo for. So again, using my line tool, I'm going to do a buildup just on those notes. Again, take a look at it over here on the piano. See how they all got colorized? So let's hear how that sounds. Boom. That's what I was looking for. That's the performance I needed. But that's just me. That's my honest way of going about this. I try the whole thing and see if the crescendo works. If the cat type of crescendo doesn't work, then I'll try individual pieces of each bar or beat. And then in the end, what I found out that this particular drum roll actually works a lot better as the crescendo rather than the whole thing. And so now I can utilize my MIDI transform on just these particular notes. In this case, I didn't use MIDI transform actually, I used the step editor. I highlighted those notes down here. And then I of course went to step editor and used my line tool to create that buildup of snares. My mouth seems to be going in and out, it's losing batteries apparently. Uh, so I'll probably end up having to change my mouse out tonight. Um, so yeah, that's a, a great way that you can, again, uh, create and draw and just use the tools you have. You may not have a MIDI keyboard, but you have the software, both in Pro Tools and Logic. You have the tools simply by going into some of the areas of these programs that allow you to do the same stuff you could have done with a real drum or with a real piano or with a real violin. So, um, again, this... Piano roll area, I use a lot when creating MIDI notes, editing MIDI notes, and doing the things that um, need to get done in order to get to the point I'm looking at. And then of course, the two things that really helped me today were things like the MIDI transform, where I set a range of random velocities. And then back here for the crescendo, I actually use the step adder, a little different way of looking at velocities. So that's all I have for you today. A uh, lot of information there, but again, some basic MIDI stuff that happens here in Logic. Um, I want you guys to ask me any questions you may have. If you started watching those master classes, um, you might have started gaining some questions already about certain things we do. You might have seen some of the stuff that we're doing here in that master class uh, video. Um, but more than likely, as the weeks go on, there'll be more questions, and of course, there'll be more information that we cross over into the master class area. We do go very far with this software, this year specifically, 
we cover a lot more ground. Um, so right now, if you're looking at uh, what could be on the test, obviously a lot of the things that we discussed yesterday, I uploaded the video yesterday after we were done, uh, rewatch it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel to find out exactly what's going on with basic MIDI tracks and setting up. And of course, um, you know, here today, utilizing the MIDI transform, the step editor, and the tools provided to you in the piano roll in order to get that final piece. I'll take your questions. Hello. Hello, sir. Is there a way to adjust how long the sustain pulls out the note? Yes, there is. If you go into, um, and we were there just to show you before, um, when we were into the, uh, where was I before? Why can't I see? Oh, here it is. Yes, there it is. Um, when we were here, um, if you remember this, right, here's our note velocities and everything. To change the data that was recorded with the sustain, that's you know, the length of the note, that you'd have to go in here and go to sustain pedal. When I go into sustain pedal, for right now, you're not going to see any sustain data because I never held the note or I never held the sustain pedal down. But if I did hold it down and created something with it, you would absolutely see that data right down here. And then you can drag it out and make it longer or shorter, depending on what you're looking to do. Same thing with the note velocity, Andrew. If in fact you see I have a note velocity, I can actually change that note velocity right here in the window. It's harder for me to do it without my mouse because it's such a small area, but um, you know, you have the ability to kind of drag it out and make it longer, shorter. Uh, you can see I'm changing the velocity right now on this particular note. So cool. same thing that you could do here, you could do with sustain pedal or any of the MIDI data that's getting recorded from your device and into the software. And that includes all this. But obviously that has to do with your device. If your de device has uh, a portamento time control on it, then you'll be able to see that data. If it doesn't, you can always draw it in using the pencil tool. But more than likely, a lot of times for performers, they like to touch the controls while performing it. It's part of how they perform their piece. What else? What else? What else? Uh, I got a question. Go ahead, Vince. What's the import, importance of velocity? So velocity is about volume, right? Um, again, if you come in here and look at my violins, you can see the colors are different. You can see the velocities are different. Um, this changes the way it sounds. So this note at a velocity of whatever it is, 56, is going to be louder than this note at a velocity of 40. To put it in real terms, if I crank this velocity up, it's just gonna be straight up louder, right? So if I select it now, you're gonna, it's gonna jump much louder. But with loudness on an instrument also comes the tonal aspect of that instrument. If you just tap on a snare drum, it sounds soft, but it doesn't have as much of the snare sound. If you whack that snare drum as hard as you can, it not only is loud, but it also picks up all the characteristics of the drum. So same thing with this violin. At a soft tone, this violin will sound a certain way. At a louder tone, yeah, it will be louder. At a larger velocity, it still will be louder, but it then takes on more characteristics, more tonal characteristics that the violin has. That's the biggest change, is not just volume, but character in the instrument. What else? What else? All right, you can still ask your questions. I'm just going to uh, jump over to the classroom again, just to remind everybody that there is a project due on Friday. There is going to be a quiz on Friday. If you haven't handed in your classwork for the last few weeks, uh, please make sure you do so. If you're missing any of these, B, C, or D, grades are going in. There's a lot of people missing. You can see where it says missing there. I flashed it quick because I don't want people stealing grades. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of people missing one or all three of these projects. Please make sure you do them. It's going into a grade book, and I'm going to have to send this over to school at one point or other for the mid-quarter report. 
Um, the other thing is for the people that took quiz 21, but never entered their email address, please make sure you do that today. Go back to quiz 21. I sent it back to you. Please make sure in the form, and I'll show you one last time, that you have to enter your email address right here. The email address you use to sign into our Google Classroom, you have to put into the quiz before you take it. That's something that didn't pop up on my radar until after we took the quiz. I had all these grades, but had no one to assign it to. I just had the generic response one, response two. The people that have done it obviously have proven that it can be done. I've graded your quiz. Your quiz grade went back to you. And once everyone has taken the quiz, we can go back and look at the stats, the questions, who got what right, who got what wrong, not specific names, but just in general, how the class did, what you get, what you don't get, what questions were harder than others. And then we can go back and review them. In the end, guys, you're going to have to take a final exam. And some of this stuff is going to be on the final exam, no matter what. Final exam is one fifth of your total grade of the year. That's going to be tough, man. That's going to be real tough. So if you're not keeping up with this stuff, you're having a tough time with it, these review sessions that we'll do probably on a Monday definitely will help you go back and again, kind of figure out what's going on within the software. I'll say it again, all the classes that we've done in Logic uh, are up on YouTube. So make sure you review the YouTube videos if in fact you missed something here in the class. And of course, make sure you do your projects. You will be fine if you show the effort to do all these projects. You will not be fine if you ignore any of this stuff thinking it's just going to go away. It won't, unfortunately. And in fact, it, you'll be even more held responsible because I don't even have to grade. I mean, I do have to grade it, but I don't even have to keep track. All I have to do is send grades to the school. Show them that you haven't been doing anything. It's all proof online, unfortunately. So there's no excuses. There's no, I did it, but I didn't hand it in. No, you didn't. It's here. It's here. It's here. And if it's not here, it's not here. It's just the way it's going to be. Um, pretty much holds you accountable for everything you do. So make sure you're doing it. Um, if no one has any other questions about logic or the projects or anything else, please make sure if you have a question that comes up later in the day uh, to get in touch with me via the Google Classroom or to my email address, all of which the information you have. Um, and if you have any uh, software concerns, I know I helped Andrew yesterday with some MIDI work in Pro Tools. You know, use uh, Instagram for that kind of stuff because then I can always go in and, and do some uh, chats with you and, and figure stuff out for you. All right. Uh, but if you're having any severe project issues or quiz issues or Google Classroom based issues, email me through Google Classroom. If it's something outside of that, do it outside of this. All right. Nothing else. All right. So tomorrow, 10 o'clock, everyone make sure they get their work done. If you haven't done your test, do your tests. If you haven't done project to projects, blah, blah, blah. This is O'Toole. I'm out. Later. See you. Bye-bye.